Well, my name is Bob Burgess and I'm the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Leicester and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here today. We're gathered here in order to tell a research story. Uh, a research story like other research stories that becomes a research adventure. And that's why people in higher education are into the business of doing research. And doing research in a variety of different ways. And in this particular case, it draws together people from a range of academic disciplines so that we see people from archaeology, from ancient history, from engineering and from genetics, just to name a few of the subjects that are involved in asking different questions from different perspectives during the course of the investigation. Now, of course, like all research adventures, research has periods when researchers are very exhilarated there are also periods where researchers become very depressed with the findings. And that's one of the things that is characteristic of any particular research project. This morning, the researchers need to put it all together uh, in order to demonst demonstrate and disseminate their findings, because part of the business of doing research is being able to communicate effectively with the public on the one hand and you, the professional journalists, on the other. In that sense, the researchers now need to come to discuss what has happened during the course of the research, what the key issues are, and of course, what the findings are. And for that, we all wait to hear what only the researchers can tell us. Namely, is it that the University of Leicester has discovered the, more, the remains of Richard III or not? It's that that we wait for the researchers to discuss. Thank you very much indeed and thank you for coming. Today, we bear witness to history. We peer 500 years into medieval times and literally reach into a grave. All that you will hear from my colleagues will be published in leading academic peer-reviewed journals such as Antiquity. What we are about to tell you is truly astonishing. Please allow us the time to explain it fully. In August, 1485, King Richard of England rode out from Leicester to face Henry Tudor at Bosworth. Defeated and killed, his body was brought back to the city slung over a pack horse, where it was displayed as a sign to his supporters that all was lost. This was probably in the Church of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Newark an added insult to the defeated Yorkists, since it was effectively a mausoleum for prominent Lancastrians. Later, his body was taken down and buried, without pomp or ceremony, in the choir of the Church of the Greyfriars. The chronicler, John Rouse, writes that Richard, at last, was buried in the choir of the Friars Minor at Leicester. Following the dissolution of the monasteries, the trail goes cold, although the historical record has the rough site of Richard's grave marked as late as 1612. But popular local legend has it that Richard's remains were thrown into the river Saw by an angry mob at the dissolution of the monasteries and lost forever. Indeed, a plaque erected in the 19th century marks the spot where this is said to have taken place in Leicester. Truth, wrote Francis Bacon, is the daughter of time, but it is also the daughter of rigorous academic investigation. In what is amongst the best archaeological world this country has seen, a team of archaeologists and scientists from the University of Leicester has led the search for Richard III, and I now invite them to present their evidence.
The local historian David Baldwin, a tutor at the University of Leicester, who I'm pleased to say is here with us today, writing over 25 years ago, believed that the king's remains still lay in the precinct of the Greyfriars, and said, it is possible, though perhaps now unlikely, that at some time in the 21st century, an excavator may yet reveal the slight remains of this famous monarch. The location of the Greyfriars precinct has never really been lost. Although the 1610 map by John Speed gets it wrong, it is clearly marked on the 1741 map of Leicester, and the site is referred to in 18th century historical accounts. But what does not survive is any information on the layout of the principal buildings. Whilst medieval religious sites have fairly predictable plans, these were often adapted to suit confined urban spaces. This, coupled with the fact that the precinct is now crossed by two streets and extensively built over and disturbed, meant that finding the church, let alone a specific burial within a particular part of this building, the choir, was always going to be a long shot. Also, should we actually find burials in the choir, would any of the skeletons actually show visible evidence to identify the individual, such as indications of injuries sustained in battle that would justify exhumation? I chose to investigate two trenches initially in the social services car park, both aligned north-south in the hope that we would pick up some east-west walls of one or more of the buildings of the friary and, if we were lucky, find some archaeological evidence to help identify the function of particular structures. The team on site and the direction of Matthew Morris started machining the first trench on the 25th of August 2012 and discovered evidence for an articulated burial almost immediately in the first five metres of the trench. This was carefully covered up at this, as at this stage we had no idea of its location within the friary. Subsequently in the second trench the evidence suggested that we'd found either the western or the eastern cloister alley, a walkway around a courtyard or cloister garth. Remarkably detailed investigation of parts of a heavily disturbed building in the first trench by Matthew and his team identified the remains of a pair of internal stone benches running alongside the walls and an area of tile flooring. This immediately suggested a place for meeting, most likely the chapter house, which would have opened off the eastern cloister walk. Yeah. The eastern cloister walk, in turn, would normally lead to the church, either to the north or, very possibly, to the south. A third trench was then opened in an adjacent car park to check out a suspected east-west wall north of the chapter house. Yeah. This revealed a pair of substantial east-west walls about 7.4 metres apart, fragments of a large stone window and evidence for two different types of tile flooring, suggesting two distinct spaces in what was almost certainly the east end of the church. In the western area were two additional parallel east-west walls and we wondered whether they could perhaps be the basis of the choir stalls. Yeah. Now we were confident that the burial found in the first trench lay somewhere inside the church, Exhumation of the individual by Joe Appleby commenced. On the same day, at a site meeting with the university's expert on urban friaries, Deirdre O'Sullivan, and an external specialist, Dr Glyn Kopak, it was agreed that we had found the junction of the choir and presbytery, the area in front of the high altar. This, of course, meant that the burial under excavation, Skeleton 1, almost certainly lay in the western part of the choir, just in front of the choir stalls. and was therefore a prime candidate to be Richard III. Within minutes of this decision, before the site meeting finished, came the revelation via Matthew Morris that the burial exhibited certain interesting characteristics, in particular, curvature of the spine and evidence of trauma to the skull. I can now show the grave and method of interment in a bit more detail. This is the empty grave pit. Um, the grave lay in an area of the first trench where a modern disturbance had destroyed most of the later medieval floor levels and where a 19th century brick outhouse had come very close to destroying the burial altogether. You can see the brickwork just here. The top of the grave lay at about 680 millimetres below modern ground level and upon excavation it was clear that it had not been cut very neatly. In contrast with burials further to the east in the presbytery, 
and on other medieval sites in Leicester, it was very irregular in shape, with sloping sides and a concave base, and was too short for the individual interred within it. The next slide that I'm going to show you is a world first, an image of the in situ remains discovered by University of Leicester archaeologists in the choir of the Greyfriars Church and excavated on Wednesday, the 5th of September, 2012. It was an extraordinary discovery that stunned all of us and has led to the five-month scientific and archaeological investigation culminating in this, this announcement today. The skeleton was in good condition and apart from the hands and sternum remained in articulation. The feet were missing almost certainly as a result of later disturbance. And of course the evidence for scoliosis or curvature of the spine could be plainly seen. There was no evidence for a coffin in the form of nails or impressions in the soil or for a shroud which might be expected to leave the bones in a rather more compact position. There was no evidence for clothing, objects of personal adornment, or other goods in the grave. A corroded iron object was found beneath two of the vertebrae, and although initial x-rays suggested the presence of a barb, indicating that it was perhaps an arrowhead, more detailed analysis has now confirmed that it's more likely to be a Roman nail disturbed from earlier levels. There were other unusual aspects to the interment. Whilst the lower limbs were fully extended, suggesting they were laid in the grave first, the torso was twisted and unusually the head was propped upright against the northwest corner of the grave, much higher than the rest of the skeleton, with the mandible open. The lower left arm was flexed across the abdomen, whilst the right arm was slightly flexed beside the torso, the hands crossing right over left at the hip. Recent excavations of over 1,300 medieval burials elsewhere in Leicester have shown that individuals were mostly laid out with the arms extended by the sides, and only very rarely were they crossed at the wrists and laid over the pelvis in this way. This raises the interesting possibility that the hands of the Greyfriars individual were tied at the wrists at the time of interment, although this is impossible to prove through scientific study as bindings would have decayed and would not leave any trace on the skeleton. Now, one of the first pieces of scientific analysis that we applied to the skeletal remains was radiocarbon dating, in the hope that this would provide confirmation that the individual died in the late 15th century, thereby ruling out the possibility that it was a much earlier burial. Two fragments of rib bone were sent to two different radiocarbon dating laboratories for analysis. Both laboratories produced results in very close agreement and consistent with the contention that the individual could have died in 1485. Having combined the analysis from the two laboratories, the results provide a model date of 1455 to 1540. Thank you, Richard. If I can introduce now uh, Dr. Joe Appleby, who's been the project's osteologist. Joe. In carrying out the skeletal an analysis of the Greyfriars skeleton, we had to answer three main questions. Firstly, did this skeleton fit with the known facts about Richard III, his age, sex and physical appearance? Secondly, what was the nature of the scoliosis and could we tell anything about how it had affected him in life? And thirdly, what could we tell about the wounds we had identified and were there any more? The analysis of the bones has been very much a team effort, and we have been collaborating extensively with colleagues both in the university and in other institutions. The skeleton is mostly well preserved and substantially complete. There are two small areas of excavation related damage to the skull. Because the skull was in an unusual position with the grave, it was struck during excavation but this has not caused major damage and has not complicated the analysis of the cranial trauma. There is also some damage to the bones caused by the 500 years that it has spent buried. The feet were truncated at an unknown point in the past, but a significant time after the burial. 
The analysis of the skeleton proved that it was an adult male, but with an unusually slender, almost feminine build for a man. This is in keeping with historical sources, which describe Richard as being a very slender build. There is, however, no indication that he had a withered arm. Both arms were of a similar size, and both were used normally during life. The skeleton is that of an individual aged between the late 20s and late 30s. We know that Richard III was 32 when he died, and this is entirely consistent with the Greyfriars skeleton. We have used measurements of the long bones to produce an estimate of height, but this is complicated by the presence of the scoliosis. Without the spinal abnormality, the Greyfriars skeleton would have stood roughly 5 foot 8 inches high. This would have been above average height for a medieval male. However, the curve in the spine would have taken a significant amount off his apparent height when standing. We cannot be sure exactly how much this would have been, but it would have been substantial. The analysis of the scoliosis took place together with Professor Bruno Morgan of the University of Leicester and Dr Piers Mitchell of the University of Cambridge. This showed that the Greyfriars skeleton had a condition known as idiopathic adolescent onset scoliosis. The word idiopathic is a complicated medical term for a simple fact. The cause of the scoliosis is unclear. What we do know is that this individual was not born with scoliosis, but that it developed after the age of 10. The condition would have put additional strain on the heart and lungs, and it may have caused pain, but we cannot be specific about this. Finally, I would like to discuss the evidence for trauma on the skeleton. This has been identified using a variety of imaging techniques that have allowed us to look at the bones in different ways. The analysis has involved Professor Sarah Hainsworth and Richard Earp from our Department of Engineering, Professor Guy Rutty, Professor Bruno Morgan, Alison Bruff and Claire Robinson from our East Midlands Forensic Pathology Unit and University Radiology Imaging Units, and Bob Woosnam Savage from the Royal Armouries Leeds. We are also grateful to the University of Bradford Biological Anthropology Research Centre who allowed us to carry out comparative analysis with, of individuals who died in the 1461 Battle of Towton. In our press conference in September, we discussed two possible wounds on the skeleton. We have now identified 10 wounds. Eight of these are on the skull, whilst two are elsewhere on the body. All of the wounds have characteristics that I identify them as perimortem, i.e. occurring at or shortly after the time of death. They could not have been inflicted after the burial of this individual, and none could have been caused by damage during excavation. Because none of the wounds overlapped, it is not possible to say for certain the order in which the injuries were received, but we can make certain speculations on the basis of what we know about medieval warfare. I will discuss each of the injuries briefly, making clear the degree of certainty of our conclusions in each case. In September, we said that we had identified a small penetrating wound on the top of the head, and you can see that here. Analysis suggests that this was caused by a direct blow from a weapon rather than by a projectile such as an arrowhead. This injury would not have been fatal. The second wound that we discussed in September was a large wound to the base of the skull at the back, and you can see that wound here. We said that this might represent a slice cut off the skull by a bladed weapon. Our work has now shown that this is indeed the case. We cannot say for certain exactly what weapon caused this injury, but it is consistent with something similar to a halberd. A smaller injury, also on the base of the skull, was caused by a bladed weapon which penetrated through to the inner surface of the skull opposite the entry point, a distance of 10.5 centimetres. You can see that second smaller injury here. Both of these injuries would have caused almost instant loss of consciousness and death would have followed quickly afterwards. In the case of the larger wound, if the blade had penetrated seven centimetres into the brain, which we cannot determine from the bones, death would have been instantaneous. A further three wounds have been identified on the outer surface of the vault of the skull. These are shallow wounds, highly consistent with where the blade of a weapon, such as a sword or halberd, has shaved off a small area of bone. And you can clearly see one of these areas here. These wounds would not have been immediately fatal, 
but could have caused death through blood loss if left untreated for a long period of time. In addition to these, there is a small rectangular injury on the cheekbone, which you can see here. Again, we cannot be certain what caused it, but it would be consistent with a dagger. The weapon that caused this injury pierced the cheek and came out on the side of the face. If inflicted during life, this wound would not have been fatal. Finally on the skull, there is a cut mark on the lower jaw. You can just see this at the bottom of the image here. This is caused by a bladed weapon consistent with a knife or dagger. Again, if inflicted during life, this wound would not have been fatal. It is hard to understand how any of these injuries could have been caused if this individual had been wearing a protective helmet. We therefore suggest that this may have been lost by this stage in the battle. The injuries to the jaw and cheek are particularly interesting in that they are less severe than attacks to the face seen in other medieval battle victims. This is, has led us to suggest that they may reflect attacks on the body after death, although we cannot confirm this directly from the bones. Examples of such humiliation injuries are well known from the forensic and historical literature, and historical sources have suggested that Richard's body was mistreated after the battle. The two wounds on the postcranial skeleton are also likely to have been inflicted after armour had been removed from the body. This leads us to suggest that they may also represent post-mortem humiliation injuries inflicted on this individual after death. The first of these is a cut mark on a rib, so you can see the mark here, and it's also lifted a small area of bone from the surface of the rib. This blow did not penetrate the rib cage. During the battle, the rib cage would have been very likely protected by elements of plate armour, a back plate, which could not have been pierced by a blow such as this. Historical sources tell us that Richard's body was stripped after the battle. This would have left his back exposed to attacks such as this. The second postcranial injury is located on the right pelvis and is highly consistent with being a blade wound from a weapon, perhaps a knife or dagger, which came from behind in an upward movement. Detailed three-dimensional reconstruction of the pelvis has indicated that this injury was caused by a thrust into the right buttock, not far from the midline of the body. Again, during the battle, this area would have been protected by armour, which would have made it difficult for an injury such as this to be inflicted. Historical sources suggest that Richard's naked body was flung over a horse after the Battle of Bosworth before being carried back to Leicester. Whilst we can never be certain of what happened, if so, this would have provided an ideal opportunity for a wound such as this to be inflicted as a symbolic act of humiliation to the body. In conclusion, the skeleton has a number of unusual features. Its slender build, the scoliosis, and the battle-related trauma. All of these are highly consistent with the information that we have about Richard III in life and about the circumstances of his death. In addition, this individual was a man around the age of 32. Taken as a whole, the skeletal evidence provides a highly convincing case for identification as Richard III. Thank you, Joe. If I can now invite Professor Lynn Foxwell from the University of Leicester, who will speak uh, and share with us uh, uh, some information about the contemporaneous accounts of Richard's appeals. Thank you. <coughs> Historical sources are as fragmentary in their own way as archaeological remains, and texts often present the viewpoints or interests of certain individuals or groups, but ignore others. Because we don't always fully understand the perspective of the writers, it can be very hard to interpret text definitively. Now, in the case of Richard III, there are, unusually, a few contemporary accounts which claim to tell us what he was like and what he looked like. But it's really hard to know, to be sure, how and how much their representations were affected by contemporary and later political event, events, such as the Tudor takeover. John Rouse was a 15th century cleric and scholar who died in 1492, not long after Richard III. Late in life, he wrote several important historical works, including A History of England. You see one page of it here. 
Um, it's written in Latin, completed in it in 1486, and dedicated by then, not surprisingly, to Henry VII. Although it includes some unflattering material about Richard III, it's not entirely derogatory, and particularly striking is the way he recounts the end of Richard's life in that particular little passage there from that page. Now, what he says is very interesting. However, if I might speak the truth to his honor as a noble soldier, though he was slight in body and weak in strength, to his last breath he held himself nobly in a defending manner, often crying that he was betrayed and saying, treason, treason, treason. And so, tasting what he had more often served to others, he ended his life miserably, and finally he was buried among the friars minor, the Franciscans of Leicester, in the choir. Similarly, according to the 18th century German copies of the writings of Nicholas von, von Popelau, a 15th century Silesian noble who met and clearly liked Richard III, um, Nicholas said, Richard was three, three fingers taller than himself, but a little slimmer, Venning Schlenker, and not so solid, Dieck, and also far leaner, Dürer. He had a delicate, subtil arms and legs, and also a great heart. Now, Joe's discoveries about the delicate, gracile character of the skeleton, which is unusual in a man of this period, might encourage us now to see these historical descriptions in a new light and to read them rather more literally than I suspect scholars and translators have done in the past. In Latin, the word vis, strength or vigor, is often a characteristically masculine quality. And of course, Rouse described Richard as viribus debilis, weak in vigor or strength. If we have identified this skeleton as the right individual, Rouse's and von Popelau's accounts could actually have been more acute and precise definitions of the living person than anyone has realized. Our archaeological research doesn't tell us anything about the character of Richard III, and of course his physical condition and appearance were not a manifestation of his character. Texts don't always tell us the facts in a straightforward way. However, it's clear that we may well have to reread and reevaluate the texts which purport to tell us about Richard's life and the circumstances of his death and burial, though my colleagues here, Sarah Knight, Marianne Lund, and Norman Housley, are much better equipped to do that than I am. But now that we may be able to set these texts against the archaeological finds, we could end up rewriting a little bit of history in a big way. If I can now invite Professor Kevin Shura to speak. Thank you very much. Almost immediately after the discovery of the skeleton, we established that we would wish to conduct DNA analysis, comparing any DNA which might be extracted from the remains to that of living day descendants and relatives. This is where I came in. We quickly identified three main tasks. Task one, identify and contact a group of living male relatives. Task two, verify and document the maternal line from Anne of York to Michael Ibsen and his siblings, Jeff uh, and Leslie, as previously identified through the important work undertaken by John Ashdown Hill. And thirdly, to identify, if possible, a second maternal line descent. So let's start with one, since that is in many ways the easiest. Now I realise that you won't be able to read all the detail on this slide, and that's not really important. The point I want to make is that for the male line, uh, you have to go up from Richard to Edward III, and then back down and since this is a noble line descended from John of Gaunt, this is very well documented through the uh, Somersets uh, and then down to the Dukes of Beaufort, who are the direct male line descent from John of Gaunt. Now, we deliberately branched 
off of the direct Beaufort male line and identified and tracked down four living male descendants, all of whom share a common ancestor uh, in Henry Somerset, the fifth Duke of Beaufort, and all thankfully agreed to take part uh, in the project. The second task, as I said, was to investigate the maternal line from Anne of York down to Michael Ibsen. Assuming that uh, any DNA could be extracted from the skeleton, we were going to concentrate on this line for reasons that uh, Dr. King will outline later on. But it was important that we verify this because we were concerned that if uh, any DNA didn't match, that may be because the skeleton actually isn't related to Anne of York, or, of course, this line is false. Now, although this line down to Anne Spooner was documented uh, well over 100 years ago, um, it isn't very well articulated in terms of providing clear documentation uh, about the link between mother and daughter. So we set about searching the archives for all the available documentary evidence. And happily, we can confirm that as far as all of the evidence shows, this lineage is good, and Michael Ibsen and his siblings are indeed true descendants of Anne of York. Finally, I should say something about task three. Uh, right from the start, this was a long shot and was always overly hopeful and ambitious. We explored several possibilities uh, and discovered several blind alleys. However, yesterday I had the pleasure of informing Michael Ibsen that he does in fact have a distant cousin. In short, we discovered a second maternal line, which is critically important in that it allows us to triangulate the two DNA samples here with that of any skeletal remains. The individual in question that we identified uh, is working very closely with the project and has donated uh, a DNA sample to help in our research. However, they wish to remain totally anonymous and we fully respect those wishes. If I may now turn to Dr. Turi King, the project's geneticist. So for me, this project has been a puzzle of two parts. Now the first part of the puzzle has been the modern DNA side. As you've just heard, I've been working very closely with Professor Kevin Schur, who has carried out a great deal of research on the genealogy side of things. And I'll start with the paternal lines. Several individuals were kind enough to take part in the project. The analysis of these modern individuals is done, and I have a consensus Y chromosome type, the piece of DNA which is just passed down through the male line, for this side of the analysis. On the maternal side, looking at mitochondrial DNA, as Professor Schur just explained, it was important to establish a second line of descent to confirm the maternal DNA line. Both of these individuals were extremely kind in being willing to take part in this project. It's worth pointing out that in a generation's time, this part of the work wouldn't have been possible. Both of these individuals are the last of their lines, so the timing of this excavation has been very important indeed for the DNA analysis. Indeed, I'm indebted to all of the study participants. Now, the second part of the puzzle was the ancient DNA analysis and to see if it was even possible to retrieve ancient DNA from the skeletal remains. DNA breaks down over time, and how quickly this happens is very dependent on the burial conditions. 
So even though the remains appear to be in relatively good condition, I couldn't be certain that I would be able to retrieve DNA from them. So the next question was, could we get a sample of DNA to work with? I'm extremely pleased to tell you that we could. Let me start with the male line data. My work on this side of the ancient DNA is in its very early stages, and it's too early to say if there's a match with the modern male line relatives. However, I can tell you that the DNA confirms Joe's analysis that these are indeed the remains of a male individual. On to the maternal side. Now the first step here was to see if the DNA sequence from Michael matched that of the second line of descent. Here is the DNA sequence, or part of the DNA sequence from Michael Ibsen. And this is that of the second lineage. As you can see, they did indeed match one another. So this verified the family tree as set out by Professor Kevin Schurer. <coughs> the next step was to see if the DNA sequence from the skeletal remains matched with these individuals. And I can now tell you, there is a DNA match between the maternal DNA from the descendants of the family of Richard III and the skeletal remains that we found at the Greyfriars dig. In short, the DNA evidence points to these being the remains of Richard III. Thank you, Zuri. If I can now turn to Richard Buckley, the lead archaeologist on the project, to deliver the university's overall verdict. It falls to me as lead archaeologist in the search of Richard III to announce the conclusion we have reached at the University of Leicester concerning the identity of the Greyfriars skeleton. You have heard today the breadth of archaeological and scientific work that has been undertaken so far. We said from the outset that we would subject the remains to rigorous investigation. This has been done under intense media scrutiny, but that has not detracted in any way from our intent and purpose to conduct world-class research and what was potentially one of the most exciting archaeological discoveries of recent years. Each piece of evidence has been scrutinised and the results of the different studies presented today have been considered by the team of specialists in order to reach a sound academic conclusion. This project has resulted in cross-disciplinary collaboration, which is a hallmark of the research conducted here at the University of Leicester and a key factor in our status as one of Britain's leading research universities. It has been an honour and a privilege for all of us to be at the centre of a project that has had such phenomenal global interest and mass public appeal. Rarely have the conclusions of academic research been so eagerly awaited. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the academic conclusion of the University of Leicester that beyond reasonable doubt, the individual exhumed at Greyfriars in September 2012 is indeed Richard III, the last Plantagenet King of England. Members of the press, academic colleagues and partners, this is an historic moment in the story of Leicester as we today announce to this world our exciting discovery. I am proud that the University of Leicester has played a pivotal role in the discovery and the telling of that story. From the outset, the search for Richard III was a thrilling prospect, but has involved many hours of dedicated research by our team that has led to the astonishing finds that we have disclosed today. I wish to pay tribute to my academic colleagues whose outstanding research has delivered today's announcement. It is a testament to their unparalleled skill in terms of the understanding of the city's heritage that such a groundbreaking discovery is presented to you today. I also wish to pay tribute to our partners, Leicester City Council and to the Richard III Society for the success of this project. In particular, Philippa Langley, from whom you will hear shortly, who captured our interest and compelled us to be part of this exciting project. 
I would also like to thank Channel 4, whose exclusive programme that has followed our search is shown tonight. There will shortly be an opportunity for journalists to view the remains, although no photography or recording equipment is permitted. A word now about reinterment. The university's application and licence from the Ministry of Justice permitted exhumation and makes it clear that, if Richard is found, then reinterment would be in Leicester Cathedral. Reinterment on the nearest consecrated ground is also in keeping with the best archaeological practice. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the university that gave the world DNA fingerprinting. Today, this is the university that confirms that Richard III, the last Plantagenet monarch of England, has been found. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. As Mayor of Leicester, I want to join Richard in marking what is indeed an historic day in the story of Britain and this great city. I want to thank all the organisations and the individuals who've helped turn this unlikely dream into an amazing reality. First, the brilliant team from the University of Leicester, the university that was the birthplace of genetic fingerprinting, and has shown today its rich, multifaceted research team, truly a worldwide centre of excellence. My thanks particularly to its Vice-Chancellor, Sir Bob Burgess, for his leadership and the sheer quality and brilliance of his organisation. Secondly, our thanks to Philippa Langley and the Richard III Society, without whose vision this project would not have happened. As Richard has just said, in anticipation of this news, we have been carrying out all the necessary consultation and the necessary notifications. And we do announce today that in accordance with the permissions that were given by the Ministry of Justice, it has been agreed by all concerned that the King's body will be reinterred here in Leicester Cathedral, in whose shadow the remains have laid for the last 500 years. The Vice-Chancellor and I have today written to the Acting Dean of the Cathedral, formally entrusting the remains into the care of that cathedral. Of course, there'll be very considerable interest arising from the announcements today, and from February the 8th, we'll be opening a temporary exhibition at the city's guild hall, right next to the cathedral, which will be called Richard III, The Search for a King. And that will only be the start because a permanent visitor centre in the Victorian school adjacent to the Greyfriars car park will be opening next year, dedicated to telling the story of King Richard III's life and death. And it is our intention that that, if at all possible, will be open uh, at a time that will coincide with the reinterment, which is, I think, perhaps likely to be early next year. Thank you again to all of the team, and thank you to this university for the excellent work that it's done. Thank you, Sir Peter. Could I uh, now invite David Monteith from Leicester Cathedral? On behalf of the Bishop of Leicester and the Acting Dean of the Cathedral, I want to say how thrilled we are to be part of this day. We're delighted with today's news, and we at the Cathedral and in the Diocese feel a huge honour to be part of a city and a community that can reveal such incredible stories as this. And we particularly want to applaud the skill, the expertise, and the excellence of Leicester University, which have led to today's announcement. Today, Justin Welby is confirmed in St. Paul's Cathedral in London as the next Archbishop of Canterbury. And so Bishop Tim Stevens, the Bishop of Leicester, is very sad not to be here with us today. 
But from word go, this has been a partnership between the council, the city council, the university, and the Richard III Society. And we've been very pleased to cooperate with all the parties. As Peter has said, I can now confirm that the cathedral have received letters from the city council and from the university to further enact the requirements of the license which led to the exhumation of these human remains. And following best archaeological practice, human remains are interred as near to their site of discovery as possible. And the license from the Ministry of Justice specifically names Leicester Cathedral. King Richard's remains found sanctuary at the Greyfriars, situated within the parish of St. Martin Leicester. And so that same parish church, which has become Leicester Cathedral, following the request today, will now begin to make significant preparation to provide King Richard with lasting and dignified sanctuary. We already host a beautiful memorial ledger stone to King Richard in the chancel, and we will now plan for his final resting place. This has been the subject of historical and scientific research, but these are the mortal remains of a person an anointed Christian king who shared the faith proclaimed by the cathedral, a faith which promises redemption and hope in the transforming power of love to bring victory out of defeat and new life even in the face of death. And our cathedral increasingly gathers all the faiths of this city and provides a focus for the whole community. Her Majesty the Queen visited last year and we begin this year with the news that we are shortly to make ready to welcome another monarch. Our cathedral is open all day, every day, and I'll be available there this afternoon if you wish to talk further with me to come and film and to discover our beautiful cathedral. It's a momentous day for our city and for our nation, and we will now formally begin the preparations for an interment. Meanwhile, we will also be praying that through the love of God, King Richard III, with all the departed, may come to rest in peace and rise in glory. Thank you, David. If I can now invite Ralph Lee from Channel 4. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, tonight at 9 o'clock on Channel 4, uh, viewers will be able to see the full story that's been described to you today about the discovery of Richard III. Um, thanks to Philippa Langley and the University of Leicester, Channel 4 have had a privileged, exclusive access to the whole behind-the-scenes story of the archaeology and the forensic science that followed. So our cameras were there at the moment when the trenches were first opened, uh, at the moment when human remains were first discovered, we follow the unearthing of the contextual archaeology that brings the focus back onto that first skeleton. We see the first moment when the curved spine of the skeleton is revealed and the uh, examination that follows. We witness as the skeleton is removed from the site in which it's found. And then viewers are also able to see the subsequent tests which you've seen so clearly in short form here. In some detail, we follow the carbon dating process the CT scanning of the skeleton, which leads to a, a detailed scientific examination of the nature and physicality of the skeleton, uh, a long analysis of the causes of death, um, uh, and uh, we filmed yesterday, with some relief, the final scene of the documentary in which the DNA results were revealed to the contributors to the film. So, uh, although the DNA results aren't actually the final scene in the documentary, the final scene is something which will be seen on Channel 4 tonight for the first time, which is uh, Caroline Wilkinson at the University of Dundee has been conducting a full facial reconstruction of Richard III's skull. So, for the first time, we'll actually be able to look into the face of the character who we found in the Greyfriars site and match that, uh, that face against the portrait. So uh, I'd just like to introduce a very brief clip which teases that scene. Thank you very much. First impressions of this skull is that it's got quite a long, gracile, in other words, not very strongly masculine features. Um, so it's, you know, it's an interesting skull to look at. It's got quite a, a lot of teeth that have been lost from the mandible, so he's going to have quite an interesting face. 
With the process that we follow for the reconstruction is to use little virtual pegs and attach them to the surface of the skull so that it gives a kind of contour map within which we can work to produce the depiction. Next step is to add the anatomical structures, starting with the eyeballs, and basically slowly build the face from the skull out to the muscle structure. As we put the muscles onto this skull, the face starts to develop. So we can start to see the shape, especially around the lower face, around the jaw. And if you want to see how that ends, <laughs> watch Channel 4 this evening. Sarah Knight and Mary Ann Lund are scholars from our School of English who will just now reflect on Richard III in literature. Of all England's monarchs, Richard III is the king whose body has mattered the most. That's because judgments about his physical appearance went hand in hand with judgments about his character and his kingship. After his death, historians, poets, playwrights made that body more and more monstrous. Sir Thomas More described him as little of stature, ill-featured of limbs, crook-backed. While Shakespeare's Richard himself said that he was deformed, unfinished, sent before my time. This is a stunning discovery, which gives us a truth about 1485, but of one kind. It gives us a physical truth. With the wealth of all this new knowledge we have, we must reinterpret how and why Richard was portrayed in the way that he was. Why, for example, do writers emphasise that he had a withered arm, a feature for which there's no evidence in Richard's skeleton? Interestingly, though, even the most hostile early Tudor sources agree that Richard died valiantly in battle, battling in the thickest press of his enemies, according to Polydor Virgil. And this skeleton, with its numerous injuries, seems to support such accounts. We have always known that Renaissance dramatists used historical sources to build their plays, that Shakespeare used Holinshed's Chronicles, for example, to help him write Richard III. But this discovery will help scholars think differently about the relationship between fiction and history. Because for the first time now, we can measure the Tudor sources which help create the story of this vilified king and Shakespeare's drama against the material remains to see how written history, archaeology and literature both intersect and diverge. And finally, last but certainly by no means least, can I invite Philippa Langley of the Richard III Society who brought a guiding enthusiasm and drive to this search. Philippa. <sighs> wow. Today marks the culmination of an extraordinary journey of discovery. When I embarked on the Looking for Richard project four years ago, the quest to find a king in a car park, everyone thought that I was mad. It's not the easiest pitch in the world to look for a king under a council car park. But luckily for me, the Richard III Society, Leicester City Council, the University of Leicester, and also Channel 4 and Darla Smithson Productions, partners with Vision, came on board. But as we got ready to look for Richard, at the 11th hour, one of our funding bodies pulled. The dig was to be cancelled. So together with writer Annette Carson, we launched an international appeal. The search for Richard was saved by donations from around the world. But with their donations, they gave us our mandate. They said to us, search for him, find him, honour him. Strange thing to say for Richard III, honour him. Richard III gave us the system of bail and opened up the printing industry, giving us books and the freedom of information. He also initiated and applied the legal principles of the presumption of innocence and blind justice. It is ironic then that Richard is still presumed guilty 
of the murder of the princes until proven innocent, even though there is no evidence that points to him having killed them. The Richard III Society is founded on a simple principle, that truth is more powerful than lies. It also considers that when investigating someone, you have two sources, those that knew them and those that didn't. They believe that your primary source must always be those that knew them. After Richard's death at Bosworth, the men of the North who had known Richard, man and boy, described him thus. The most famous prince of blessed memory. In the intervening centuries since King Richard's death, many have told his story, not least Shakespeare and the Tudor writers. But now, here today, as you have heard, it is Richard who has finally been able to reveal himself. <coughs> when Richard's body was stripped naked at Bosworth, his physical condition, his scoliosis, became known. And it was used to insult and degrade him. Today we know that a physical abnormality is not a sign of evil. We find this idea abhorrent. We are no longer in the Tudor mindset. On Channel 4 this evening, as you have heard, and also tomorrow morning at the Richard III Conference in London, you will be able to see Richard's face for the very first time. This has been done, as you've also heard, by Professor Caroline Wilkinson at the University of Dundee. The two-dimensional caricature promoted by the Tudors will be no more. In September 2010, the Looking for Richard project commissioned the design of a tomb based upon Richard's life and what was important and meaningful to him. Undertaken by a team of Ricardians, the tomb design has been welcomed by the Cathedral, the Council and the Richard III Society and will be revealed in the next few weeks. The first donation of £10,000 has already been received. The discovery of King Richard is a historic moment when the history books will be rewritten. A wind of change is blowing, one that will now seek out the truth about the real Richard III. And as regards our mandate from those around the world, we have searched for Richard and we have found him. It is now time to honour him. The text that you will see on the screen here is the Act of Parliament that settled the crown upon, upon King Richard and his heirs, all copies of which Henry Tudor tried to destroy. I would like to finish by thanking the incredible team on this project who believed in it enough to come with me First of all, the University of Leicester and all of its specialists. Richard Buckley, the first meeting that we had was an interesting one where I think he was looking at me out of the corner of his eye. But thank you, Richard, for, for coming with me on this and for leading the archaeological search. And I'd also like to thank Leicester City Council. They allowed us to dig up their car park. And <laughs> It wasn't the easiest thing in the world. It was a very busy car park and it was a very important car park because it was their social services car park. So Peter, thank you. There's also a lady, and I don't know if she's, yeah, I've just seen her. There's a lady here today that I need to thank. And her name is Sarah Levitt from Leicester City Council, head of their museum services. Sarah has been a champion of this project from the first day that I walked into Leicester City Council. And without her, we would not be here today. I'd also like to thank the Richard III Society, and in particular their chairman, Dr Phil Stone. Phil has been with me from the very first day of this project and has been my guiding person. And again, without Phil, we wouldn't be here. Also, Channel 4 and Darlow Smithson Productions. Um, the pitch, when I gave it to them, the eyebrows went up. 
but they believed in it when a lot of people didn't. So I really have to thank you guys for coming with me. Thank you.